billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim bismillahi ar-rahman ar-rahim assalamu alaykum viewers of imam hussain tv welcome to tonight's live program last week we discussed the holy personality the eighth holy imam imam ali al-rida alayhi salam just to briefly recap we mentioned his attributes his divine birth his mother's dear name and the origins. We also spoke about the spread of uh, Tashayyu Fiqh from the Imam Jafar Sadiq Islam. And we also ended right at the end with his travels as it were. He traveled from Basra or via Basra to Iran. And inshallah we'll now go back to that same point to discuss the same topic which is basically the social dimensions of Walaya through Imam Ali al-Rida al-Islam. With me tonight, again, I am honored to have with me Dr. Sayyid Amar Natrani. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. Um, again, inshallah, we will discuss and just very quickly recap, as it were, where we were. Because I think one session, indeed probably a dozen, doesn't really do justice to discuss any masum or even any, in this case, the, the holy eighth Imam, Imam Ali Rida al-Islam. So, we left off, I believe, um, where we discussed and analysed his brief journey, as it were, from Basra to Shat al-Arab. Um, and he reached the Persian soil and he could easily, have, and also his followers, the Shia followers, as it were, of Islam, could easily have had, a, maybe not a rebellion, but there could have been an outcry, as it were. What exactly happened? Why did he take the route eventually, in the first instance, when he could have predetermined exactly what the fate would be? Sure. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It's a very interesting period to examine, that period uh, of the journey of Imam al-Rada alayhi salam from Medina towards uh, Khurasan. I think we all recognize that none of the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt want to leave Mecca or Medina. And we had mentioned how sometimes they're coerced into leaving. Right. Uh, and this really was a, a situation of coercion. But an Imam, of course, knows what's best for the community at the time. And you really notice that after Karbala, mm -hmm. there is uh, a worldview or an approach that is taken. And one may even argue that this was this since Karbala and before even. Okay. Because even with Karbala, Imam Hussain alayhi salam, it wasn't the norm for him to want to enter the battlefield. The norm was reconciliation in the Ummah. Right. He even sets out to Karbala by saying that we're seeking reconciliation. I think Imam al Radha alayhi salam as well follows that legacy of the Imams from Zain al Abideen all the way till his father Imam al Kadhim alayhi salam that they believe that reconciliation on the one hand is needed in the Ummah and they also believe that if one has to even dissimulate their faith um, and conceal some of that which they know to safeguard the interests of the Shia at that time. Right. So it has to be done and I remember reading a tradition where someone asks uh, Imam al Radha alayhi salam, are you sahib al-amr? Are uh -huh. you the, uh, you know, the one who is the companion of the command or the master of the, the affair time. of the time. Um, and he replies that while I am Sahib al-Amr of this time, I am not the one who the traditions refer to. Right. Rather, at his time, people will come out openly with their beliefs and will come out openly with no fear of concealing. Whereas in my time and the time of the followers of Ahlul Bayt, we may have to be in a state of taqiyya. Okay. Now, there's an underground movement which my which my beloved um, uh, teacher, Dr. Jasim Hussain, who has written the, the wonderful book, The Occultation of the Twelfth Imam, okay. where he looks at the Wikala underground movement that took place from Imam al sadiqs time onwards, where the sh there really was an underground movement where the Imams would liaise with their companions in secrecy. Okay. You know, you want to collect khums, you can't openly collect khums under the, you know, under the caliph of Harun al-Rashid or Mansur al-Dawaniqi. So you have certain companions who are doing this on your behalf. And I think likewise, this is exactly what begins to happen with Imam al-Rada alayhi salam. He continues an underground secret movement where you've got followers of Ahlul Bayt positioned, some in Cairo, some in Kufa, some in Baghdad. 
and okay. they all have a responsibility. But Al Ma'mun has already had a battle with his brother Al Amin. Yes, they've beheaded the brother. You know, uh, Baghdad is a place full of blood, um, and so Al Ma'mun believes that you know, coercing Imam al Rada alayhi salam to come towards that land is gonna, number one, bring him the Alid vote, and number two, is gonna possibly uh, quash or even quell the rebellions from the Hassanid line. So I remember, see. the grandchildren of Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam, many of them had rebelled against the Abbasid Caliphate. The Husseini right. line, there isn't that rebellion. But in the Hassani line, that rebellion seems to exist. Okay. The Imams don't feel that rebellion is the way forward for their community. Right. Um, and not that the Imam trusts what Ma'moon's doing. But there's a sizable Shia population there. As we had mentioned, the famous Ash'ari tribe had mm -hmm. already established themselves as the Shia of Qum. Right. And there were Shia in other provinces as well. Yes. So it was a place where at least he could have some of his closest companions with him. Okay. You know, you look at the likes of, um, you know, Rayyan ibn Salt, for example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. close companion. Some say he's of Baghdadi origin, others say he's a Khurasani origin. Right. These people would have connections in these areas. They'd have contacts, they'd know families in these areas. So it wasn't like Imam al salam was going there without having known that there can still be a Shi'i connection. Okay. Okay. But he also wanted to make clear that there wasn't much trust of the person in power. Right, yeah. okay, okay. Now there's many instances, um, actually n we haven't got enough time to actually discuss all of them. But let's pick a few, I think, inshallah, um, to analyse and really dissect and dwell and see what we can actually take from that, the lessons. So the first one that I'm going to pose to you is the famous incident of the Eid al-Fitr prayer where uh, he was requested as it were to lead the prayer what happened and uh, correct me if I'm wrong the holy Imam refused initially what exactly happened and what what, what was so poignant about this sure incident? sure well Al Ma'mun wants to tell everybody that listen this is my successor this is the prince this is the one who's going to look after the religion after me the Imam wants nothing to do with that right and the Ma'mun continuously stresses that you have to, and the Imam wants to reject taking this. And the Ma'mun, the Ma'mun decides that, he reminds the Imam that in the same way your grandfather Ali was forced to be in a shura of six when they were deciding about the appointment of Uthman bin Affan. Uh -huh. You know, when Uthman becomes Khalifa, yes. originally there's, yes. there's a shura of six Umar ibn al-Khattab the decides were, yeah. where they were deciding who should be the Khalifa. So you had Talha, Zubair, mm -hmm. Abdul Rahman bin Awf, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, uh, Uthman bin Affan, and Imam Ali bin Abi Talib alayhi salam. So what happens is that Umar makes it clear that in that shura of six, that if five agree on the next Caliph and one disagrees, you have to kill the one that disagrees. So if, that's how it was. Yeah, yeah, you have to kill the one that disagrees. And it's quite interesting because these six are meant to all be granted Jannah. And really, you know, this constant repetition of the granting of paradise to certain individuals, the other side of the coin is that some of these individuals were in near bloodshed moments with one another. You know, you only have to look at the Battle of Jamal, you know, Talha and Zubair on one side, Ali yep. on the other. And Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, feels it's important for her to look after the interests of Talha and Zubair um, at that time, even though Ali on the other side is another of those promised Jannah. And so what happens is that if five agree and one disagrees, you have to kill the one that disagrees. And if four agree and two disagree on who the Khalifa should be, say for example, four of you agree, then two disagreed, and the two that disagreed were Abdul Rahman bin Awf and Ali bin Abi Talib, you have to behead the two of them. But right. you'll still end up meeting in Jannah. And then if you have um, three that agree and three that disagree, yes. then the appointment is in the hands of Abdul Rahman bin Awf. And Abdul Rahman bin Awf famously says that he believes that Ali should be the next Khalifa as the third Khalifa. Okay. If he follows 
the sunnah of the Prophet and of the Shaykhain of Abu Bakr and Omar. And Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, refuses this. And then when he asks Uthman, will you follow the sunnah of the Prophet and the Shaykhain? Uthman accepts and therefore Uthman becomes Caliph. Now there's a number of interesting points here. Right. The first one obviously is willingness to behead people if they don't come to a decision that you agree with. Yes. I don't know, you know, obviously the later concept came in of ijtihad that anyone who comes with their own ijtihad, uh, you know, sometimes people make mistakes, you know, involving beheadings. Then there is number two, the second interesting point is if the sunnah of Abu Bakr and Omar is the same as that of the Prophet, why then would there be a need to make them a condition? Mm -hmm. You see, why would you need to say you have to follow the sunnah of the Prophet Abu Bakr and Omar when you could easily just say, will you follow the sunnah of the Prophet? And that's where Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, says that I'll follow the sunnah of the Prophet, but not of anybody else. And, um, and this, by the way, is interesting um, that you find within uh, Sunni literature that there did reach a point in the Muslim Ummah where someone would say that's the sunnah of the Prophet and others would say but Abu Bakr and Omar said. <laughs> and in Usul al-Fiqh it's an interesting discussion as, um, in, you know, if you're looking at Usul al-Fiqh in Ahl al-Sunnah wal Jama'ah, it's an interesting discussion that if there is a hadith that says the Prophet said and then Ibn Abbas says that there's a group who say Abu Bakr and Omar said then in Usul al-Fiqh all they say is that it shows the Prophet's you know, the Prophet's words comes above the companions rather than dissecting why would there now be a different sunnah. But the point that Ma'moon wants to push yeah. forward is that your grandfather was compelled to take a position. And likewise, you're going to be compelled as well. Meaning that, you know what, I am willing to behead. I have no problem with it whatsoever right. if you don't abide by this. To which Imam al-Radha interestingly says, okay, I'll take a position. But you can't expect me to be someone who, uh, you know, legislates and gives verdicts and, and so on. So, you know, I'll take a position that's very, uh, how could we call it? You know, when you put someone in a political position who really is not making many decisions, no. but you've put them there. And Imam yeah. says, listen, I'm not going to lead anything. I'm not going to legislate anything. Um, and I'll take that position. And so they want to have this pomp or this uh, wonderful gathering yes. on the day of Eid and you know Al-Ma'moon wants Ali ibn Musa Radha to lead Salah right you know Eid Salah is wajib yes in the presence of a Ma'asum Ma'asum in our day you know it falls similar to Salat Al-Jum'ah it's an option yeah, you know. yeah sure and so Al-Ma'moon thinks you know what Imam al is going to come out and he's going to have that you know like the pompous look that Al-Ma'moon would have or the regalia that would be ex ex uh, expected of an Abbasid or an Umayyad Caliph, mm -hmm. Imam al-Radha on the contrary comes out barefooted. Barefoot, yes. Um, as is recommended, following the sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, and, and the simplicity and the look and the crowds and the throngs of people who are now following him. And al Ma'mun's taken aback by this. That they this actually, man, sorry, they actually followed him actually wearing yeah, the same yeah. sort of attire, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, everyone started following him. Because they felt that for the first time in a long time, the sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family is now returning. Because you notice that with the Umayyads, you know, Omar has a famous discussion with Muawiyah as to what the hell's going on with all this pomp and regalia that you're exhibiting in Sham. Muawiyah wants to try and justify it, you know, by highlighting that, you know, there are certain dignitaries from others, uh, other empires that come and visit and we have to live up to the time. Yeah, yeah. And um, likewise with Imam al-Radha alayhi salam. And I'm, I'm, I'll say something very interesting here as well, that while for that Salat al-Eid, mm -hmm. it, it shook the community, there were others who began to question Imam al-Radha as to how he could take a position where he's going to now be in a palace, let's say, and he's going to have, you know, really comfortable sofas to sit on. And Imam al-Radha replies to this person. He says to him, Nabi Yusuf salam didn't sit on comfortable sofas. <laughs> if you look in our community sometimes, if someone gets into politics, yes. they either condemn them as kafir, munafiq, or thief. 
It's very rare for our community to ever have anything good to say about anyone who enters politics. That's a good point. Now, there are some people who've entered politics and destroyed their rep. There are others, rep's not bad at all. Yes. But people have this, uh, bring, this um, bring these two concepts together, politics and corruption. So when they bring these two concepts together, politics and corruption, if someone enters politics straight away, these people you'll find never studied that Imam al Radha worked with Al Ma'moon, um, Ali bin Yaqtin was told by Imam Musa al Kalam to remain with Harun al Rashid, um, Imam al Hassan does a treaty with Muawiyah, Muawiyah. Yeah. Imam Amir al Mu'minin decides that certain personalities he's got to cooperate with, even though we know what our opinion is of some yes, of those personalities yes. and so on. So, Firstly, the one who enters politics, and this is the wonderful thing about the lives of Ahlul Bayt, there are lessons from each from a different angle. The one who enters politics, they call him a kafir, or they call him a munafiq, or they call him a thief. Yes. Why do they call him a thief? They call him a thief because there is also this concept that when you enter politics, you should be someone who tries to live as the poorest of your yes. society. Now, yes. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib did that. That was known. Mm -hmm. Imam Musa al-Kadhim, on the other hand, for example, was known to own a number of shirts. Imam al-Radha alayhi salam, now there's a major question mark because when Imam al-Radha becomes the heir apparent or the prince of the mm -hmm. nation, mm -hmm. or as the Iranians would love to always throw the word Sultan in. Yes, yes. Um, I don't know if that's very Arab to throw a Sultan always when you say Ali ibn Musa. I think that's more of a you know, Iranian, you know, sultans and kings okay. and so on. But people were now starting to say that, how could he be sitting on these couches? And what's interesting is there are prophets of Allah who lived very comfortable lives. Just because someone has a very nice couch or lives in a very nice house or dwelling, or even if there's a politician who's living in a nice area, mm -hmm. you know, Nabi Dawood, Nabi Sulaiman. Nabi Sulaiman's kingdom, you know, people in, in London and Manhattan would be jealous yeah, of, of you know, how that palace was, you know? The glass floor. You, yeah, the glass floor. You ain't going to find nothing like that in the Hamptons no. or in, no. you know, in, in Beverly Hills or in, in Monaco. You know, this, this, this palace is beyond belief. Now, how could they have that? How could Imam al-Radha alayhi salam live like that? And Imam al-Radha would straight away point to Nabi Yusuf. Like, Nabi Yusuf had a comfortable couch. Do you have a problem with him? Yes. And then all of a sudden people are like, no, 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 I have a problem. So this thing in our communities where we generalize completely on people who either enter politics or are living comfortably because of success politically. Yes, yes. I think Imam al-Radha shatters that quite a yeah, bit. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. That's a very good point that you made, actually. Yeah. You know, uh, unfortunately, there is this stigma that people perhaps may be jealous, perhaps may, as you said, you know, assume that one who is the masum or the imam has to leave an ultra humble life according to their vision as it were but uh, no thank you for that um, there's another very famous incident and this actually ties in really nicely I think with the actual title of uh, tonight's show and the last show which was with, uh, with regards to the dimensions of Walaya and there's a famous hadith as it were in English it's often referred to as the fortress hadith but Formally and officially, it's referred to as the Hadith al Silsla al Dahabiya. Yes. What exactly is it, and why is it so, so crucial to un actually understand and dwell into the dynamics of it? Because this is really, really going to the core. Now. Yeah, Silsla al Dahabiya, the golden chain, I wish we had more golden chains. Right. I wish we had more in the world of Hadith. I think, you know, Osuli scholars out there would certainly have wished that we had. Um, a lot more golden chains with tawatur rather than having to go to a world of, you know, trying to prove khabar al-wahid and so on. Because the golden chain is, is when you have a hadith, Imam al-Radha alayhi salam from Imam al-Kadhim narrates, from Imam al-Sadiq, from Imam al-Bathir, from Imam Zain al-Abideen, from Imam al Hussein, from Imam al Hassan, from Amir al Mu'mineen, from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, who obviously would be from Jibra'il, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That golden chain, the reason I say I wish we had more of it is because, you know, in the world of hadith, you've mm -hmm. got so many different issues that pop up in the world of hadith where you really can't find this golden chain so much. So when you have it, like gold, it's precious. Mm -hmm. 
to have a golden chain hadith, it's absolutely precious. You know, because in the world of hadith, you've either got, you've got this classification where you're either in the world of tawatur, where then you're like, yes, we're in the world of tawatur, we're comfortable. Yep. Or if we haven't reached tawatur, then we're going in the world of mustafid and khabar al-wahid. Mm -hmm. We're not reaching tawatur, we're going in a world where, okay, we can rely on that person who brings us a narration, although it's not got as many chains and generations of narrators as, as we'd like. And then we begin to open up a lot more areas. Opinions and so on. So opinions so and so yeah. on about, you know, um, about the significance of, of hadith. Yeah. Um, you know, some of the Usuli scholars, they say when, the, when you look at the Quran, it's قَطْعِي الصُّدُورِ ظَنِّي الدَّلَالَةِ Right. Whereas when you um, look at hadith, it's ظَنِّي uh, الصُّدُورِ and قَطْعِي الدَّلَالَةِ And what they mean by all of this is that the Quran, in terms of transmission, fantastic. Okay. But then in terms of what you're, you know, what you're learning from is open to debate as to, you know, um, uh, what's signif being signified from this message in this ayah. You know, we, we know that the Quran, in the world of hadith, in terms of, um, in terms of it, open to question. In terms of what's being learned from it and significance, open to so tips. much significance, so much which will be applied into our traditions. Right. And so when you look at that golden chain, you have this wonderful moment where you've got the Imam narrating from Imam al kamil narrating from Imam mm -hmm. al-Sadiq, that divine light in the descendants of Abraham. SubhanAllah. Dhurriyat Ibrahim, which continued and was manifested through Abu Talib and Abdullah. Abdullah having Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Abu Talib having Imam Ali as his son. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa having Fatima al Zahra. Imam Ali marrying Fatima al Zahra. That golden divine light. And that's why in the durood, what does everyone say? Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi. Kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala alihi. Oh Allah, send your blessings on Muhammad and his family like you send your blessings on Abraham and his family. That divine light shone through, inherited in the charismatic authority of the Imams of Al Muhammad, allowing the manifestation of Thaqalain to happen. Quran and Ahlul Bayt, all that one. And so, that hadith, what happens is when he finishes providing the Isnad, and it's very interesting mm -hmm. that when, we're, when we look at the world of hadith, you look at, for example, um, you've got the sciences. Yes. Um, in the world of hadith, there's, you know, you're going into diraya and within diraya, the rijal and the isnad, and you're looking also for metan and, you know, other areas of hadith. When you're going into that world, you're finding that many will assume that the isnad system might have begun, for example, from Shaykh al Kulaini and Shaykh al Tawsi and Shaykh al Sadduq Super. and so on. Whereas you've got Imam al Islam providing an isnad for the famous hadith. So he gives the isnad mm -hmm. from Imam al-Kadhim, from Imam al-Sadiq, from Imam al-Baqir, from Imam al from Imam al abidin from Imam al-Husayn, from Imam al-Husayn, from Imam al-Ali, from Rasulullah SAW, from uh, Jibrail, from, uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, kalimat la ilaha illallah husni. Which in English is? There is no God by Allah. In English is that the fortress. Fortress, yes. Fortress. fortress. That la ilaha illallah, there is no God but Allah, is the fortress. Affirmation as it were. Yes. فَمَنْ دَخِلَ حُسْنِ أَمِنَ مِنْ عَذَابِ Whoever enters my fortress, whoever enters the fortress, is protected from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? Yes. So Allah is saying to us that la ilaha illallah, that's my fortress. The one who enters it, and I think that could open up some phenomenal discussions. Yes, yes. And I think, you know, perennialists out there will love it because they'll be like, listen, anyone who believes in God, there's different paths to God. Pluralists out there will love this tradition because they'll be like, look, there's more than one way to Allah. There's more, more than one way to God. True. Um, but then the people are bewildered because they're like, that's it. 
we all know that we have to say La ilaha illallah. We all know that. Yeah. And we all know that anyone who says La ilaha illallah is in the fortress of Allah. Allah is never going to punish someone who says La ilaha illallah. Although quite ironic in the Muslim world today, how many got beheaded even though they believe in La ilaha illallah. But that's ISIS and their, yes, yes. And their world. But then the Imam says, I am one of the conditions, conditions. of La ilaha illallah. Millions may say La ilaha illallah in this world. But how many of them know who Ali ibn Musa is? There are many out there who will say, I love the Ahlul Bayt. You Shia are nothing special just because you love the Ahlul Bayt. We love the Ahlul Bayt. But it's not about special. You know, it's not war over here. Yeah. It's not war. It's, you know, where, what have we got to lose by learning more about the beautiful lights of Ahlul Bayt? I think... Ahlul Sunnah and their origin, you'll find that they have an immense love for Ahlul Bayt It's only the likes of Ibn Taymiyyah who try and, you know, really jump in and say, well, you know what, first, first few, you've got to give them respect. The next few, yeah, scholars. The last lot, nah, you yeah. know, pretty average. Yeah. And sadly, they miss out on understanding that one of the conditions of La ilaha illallah is the belief in the Thaqalain, the Qur'an and yes. the Ahlul Bayt side by side, you hold on to them, you will never go astray. Right. But the interesting point about this uh, hadith is that it's uh, narrated in numerous Sunni books as well. I mean, Sheikh Saduq mentions this and it's seen as being extremely authentic, but it continues in certain Sunni books as well. And that's what's quite ironic that as you mentioned, some, you know, Sunnis have this love for Ahlul Bayt. But in terms of actually going into the detail, it's often overlooked. Well, I think um, if it, when it's mentioned in the books of our brothers and our son, I think kalimat la ilaha illallah husni, faman dakhila husni amina min adabi. I think that part is definitely mentioned. As right. to Imam al Rada alayhi salam and saying, I am one of the conditions of la ilaha illallah, I think you'll find there's a difference of opinion as to that last part. Okay, yeah. okay. We'll go to the next um, section now where the Holy Imam had a number of different debates and there's numerous debates. For example, there's a debate with a uh, Hindu high priest, there's a, a debate with um, numerous personalities who were seen as being quite famed for their knowledge at that time. What, what, what sort of lessons can we get from that as it were? You know, it's interesting when you mentioned talking about debates because I think um, there's a lot of people who constantly call me out for debates and wanting to debate and so on. And I, and I noticed someone from one of our brothers in the mosque, he had, sent me, uh, he had sent me a clip and he's like, oh, you know, there was a lecture that you gave and you said anyone who wants to debate me, you know, feel, you know I'll debate them at any time. And it was very interesting how they cut and paste that particular quote of mine from a completely different lecture in a completely different context, mm -hmm. how they took a, a quote from the lecture on Shia Sunni marriage, cut it, and then pasted it somewhere else and said, look, you're challenging us all for a debate. And it's very interesting how many Muslims out there just want to be involved in, in debates, but the intention in many occasions, sadly, is egoistic battles against one another. And in many cases, you'll find Imam al-Radha alayhi salam, his first approach wasn't debates. Imam al-Radha would say, listen, you have your theological school, we have ours. We'll present ours, you present yours. And the people are free to choose which one they want. Yes. Today when you hear everybody is saying that, you know what, debate, debate, debate. Listen, buddy, you have your presentation, I have my presentation. Sure. And you know, at the end, if anyone finds guidance to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, um, through your lectures, then so be it. And if they find it through mine, then so be it. So Imam al-Radha's first course was not, let's go out looking for debates with everybody. Okay. No, no. Al-Ma'moon is the one who compelled Imam al-Radha, alayhi salam, to debate. And challenge. And challenged him to be ready and show whether he really has knowledge against the priest of his time, the rabbi of his time, the Zoroastrian of his time, the Hindus of his time, yes. eight of his time. First thing Imam shows us in these debates, the best ethics. He's not condescending towards them. You know, sometimes when you're in a debate, you may have this urge to arrogantly yeah. make fun of somebody or to egoistically, 
you know, put someone down. I think that's why in many cases when you don't want to entertain these debates because your own ego is going to get in your way. You're just going right. to start taking the mick out of each other and others out there are just going to look and say, look at these two, the way they're talking to each other with rudeness or sometimes with disrespect. The Imam, firstly, the akhlaq is there. Secondly, the Imam never himself says, I'm the scholar of the scholars. Okay. No. On the contrary, I remember Imam al Baqir was asked by a priest, he so. said to him, you're the scholar of Al Muhammad, he said, I'm not one of the ignorant. See the difference? Mm -hmm. you, know, I need, you don't need to call me a hundred names. I'm not one of the ignorant. But the third thing, and I think we'll come to it, inshallah, shortly after the break, inshallah. is the way he looks at certain concepts of the beliefs of others and the way he provides an answer to those concepts that in some cases left the person on the other side dumbfounded by his point. Okay, okay. So now, thank you for that. Um, brothers and sisters, we're just going for a short break. Please do join us after the break again, inshallah. Asalaamu Alaikum. <laughs> And welcome back to tonight's live program on Imam Hussein TV. With me, we have Dr. Sayyid Amar. Dr. Sayyid Amar, assalamu alaikum. And inshallah, if we can just resume the um, great discussion actually today, because I think it's uh, attracting quite a big audience in terms of. So we just left off in terms of the debates. Yeah. So he had uh, the holy Imam had a number of debates, discussions, and then actually, as you mentioned, without any. Um, forcing of um, authority or trying to influence anyone by condescend them and criticize yeah, them yeah, and so yeah. on and so forth. So uh, from my understanding, he had a debate with a priest, a Hindu priest, sorry, an atheist, a Jewish rabbi, and I'm sure others as well. So if we can just probably just hide, uh, highlight those um, points. And I'd maybe. love, you know, I'd love for our, for our viewers to be able to go online and type uh, Imam al Radha's debate with yes. the Christians, yes. with the atheists, um, with the Jewish uh, rabbi, um, with the Zoroastrians, and mm. with the Hindus. And I think what was beautiful is that Khorasan at that time was quite a diverse, uh, pluralistic okay. society. You right. know, I think sometimes people imagine that in early Islam there wasn't that pluralism and that freedom of thought for mm -hmm. all of these, you know, heads of the religions to be able to be in Khurasan right. shows what the real Islam was rather than what the Islam has become. Okay. You know, I think sadly today, Muslims in some cases have no respect for the fact that there are people of other religions mm. who have their path towards their Lord, their understanding, sure. their heritage and so on. If I give a couple of, uh, just a glimpse of, of these debates of which I remember quoting in my biography of the Ma'asumin series in 2000 and, um, I think it was 2011 or something. I see. I think first and foremost with the, with the Jewish rabbi, the imam said to him that you have a reverence for Moses. And he said to him, yes. So what makes you revere Moses? Mm -hmm. So he says to him, um, well, you know, there are certain miracles associated with Moses that make us revere him. If I were to ask you, for example, what miracles do you remember in Moses' life did Allah give him? Which mu'jizah did he give him that made him prove his nubuwa? Yes. You'd say to me, obviously, the magic. The magic, correct? the parting the of the sea. The magic, or the parting of the sea. So Muhammad Rada asks the Jewish rabbi, he says to him, so that was your criteria for believing in Moses, miracles. He's like, yeah. Right. He's like, so any prophet or anyone who displays miracles, you'll take? He said, yes. He said, so what made you reject Christ? Uh -huh. If Christ is able to raise the dead and make them alive, or sure. Christ is able to cure the leper, or Christ is able to cure the blind, as yes. we have in yes. the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah 3, verse 49, all of the miracles of Jesus, son of Mary. And we in the school of Ahlul Bayt, unlike other schools in Islam, 
have the most emphasis on Jesus' life in our narrations. You look at the description of Jesus in Nahj al balagh for example, or in other works, you'll find that there are other famous schools in Islam whose two main books don't have a single narration about Jesus' life. So we have that emphasis. So he tells the Jewish rabbi, and the Jewish rabbi is dumbfounded because if my criteria for accepting someone as a prophet or as a messiah is that they've displayed miracles, why did you reject Christ? Yes, yes. Then he comes to the Christian priest. He comes to the Christian priest. He say, the Christian priest says to him, who do you believe is greater, Jesus or Muhammad? Imam Radha says to him, while Jesus is a great prophet of God, Ulil Azim, etc., etc., the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, is the greatest because he fasted and prayed more than Jesus. The Christian priest replied by saying, How dare you say that someone prayed more than the Lord Jesus? To which Imam Radha replied, if he is your Lord, can you tell me who he was praying to? <laughs> yeah? If Jesus, son of Mary, is your Lord, who is he praying to? Now, Christian theology will say, well, he was the Lord in the heaven and came down. The Trinity would then be explained. But to Imam al that was enough of an explanation. Yes. What we're seeing, therefore, with these debates is that the Imam first shows recognition of the main protagonists of those faiths. Moses, Jesus, they're mentioned. Yeah. They're not disrespected in any way, you know, they're, they're revered. But he contrasts and compares their position with the position of Islam on Christ or on the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. Yeah. Viewers do call in. The number should appear on the screen of Imam Hussain TV um, to pose and uh, ask, uh, say now your questions. Inshallah, we can discuss the questions as well in this session, which is the final session. The number should appear on the screen right now. Um, Sayyidina, the, um, there's an interesting question that's come in, in terms of um, talking about a personality who I believe was a companion, uh, Rayyan al, al bin al-Salt. Yes. Who exactly was uh, this prominent figure? Rayyan ibn al-Salt. Firstly, I just want to say something. Yeah. Rayyan is a cool name. Okay. And... We live in a generation of young families who want to have cool names for their sons. Mm -hmm. Now, I might be old school, you know, straight to the Ahl al-Bayt's names, but there are others who will be like, listen, I want to name my son a cool name um, so that, you know, my non-Muslim friends can be like, oh, that really sounds exotic or it sounds like a pineapple from, you know, Turkey or something. Trendy or something. Or trendy or something. So one of the cool names that I would recommend uh -huh is the Rayyan. Okay. Now, if I'm not mistaken, Rayyan is, you know, this heavenly gate by which those who fasted in the holy month of Ramadan enter. Right. So if you fasted in the holy month of Ramadan, on the day of judgment, you enter through the gate of Rayyan. Okay. It's a heavenly gate. I see. Let alone other angelic um, connotations I don't want to go into. But this Rayyan bin, uh, ibn Salt, phenomenal personality, really okay. is. Um, I think if you're looking, for example, at someone who was a close confidant of at least a couple of the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt, for sure. You know, um, Imam al radha Imam al-Jawad, some might even go towards Imam al-Hadi, alayhi salam. Um, you know, a personality who was a famous narrator of the traditions of Ahl al-Bayt, alayhi salam. You know, man kuntu mawla fa'ad ali mawla. Um, you have Rayyan ibn al-Salt. Ali is to me like Aaron was to Moses, Rayyan ibn al-Sal. Okay. Um, and he's with the Imam in that difficult period in Khurasan. Possibly in some, uh, in some opinions, observing taqiyya, okay. not really revealing all of his beliefs. But I think you'll find his legacy, you know, Muhammad and Ali, his sons, uh, renowned narrators of traditions. Right. You know, what legacy do you want than sons who narrate traditions from Imam al-Hadi or Imam al-Askari alayhi salam? And also, I believe that he's definitely a faqih of his time. Okay. I think he corrects other jurists. Right. Maybe even theologically, I remember reading uh, Yunus bin Abdul Rahman and Rayyan ibn Salt on Imam al Jawad's age for being an Imam. So remember, Imam al Radha has Imam al Jawad, alayhi salam. Imam al Radha is close to passing away. Imam al Jawad, seven, eight years of age. And there's a discussion between Yunus bin Abd al-Rahman and Rayyan bin Salt. These are, these are two huge 
personalities in Shia history. Okay. And Yunus bin Abdul Rahman seemingly has a question mark about the age of Imam al-Jawad and becoming an Imam and having that much ilm. And Rayyan ibn Salt famously replies back to him by saying whether he's a day old or a month old or a hundred years old. Right. Allah, when he wants to, can inspire any of his creation to have ilm. ilm. Like we saw with Nabi Isa, Inni Abdullah Atani yes. al-Kitab yes. wa Ja'alani Nabiya. So with Rayyan ibn Salt, you've got this you know, great personality, really. And someone who, who looked after the affairs of the Imam in his own way. Okay, I think there's a question. Salaam alaikum. Uh, the call's been dropped, um, Sayyidna. Um, there's another question that's been uh, handed over. Um, why is Imam Ali al Rida al-Islam referred to Imam Zamin? Yeah, Imam Zamin or Imam Zamin as some will. Sometimes I see like in weddings people put an Imam Zamin on yeah. or they put something, for example, on their... Right the, arm. Uh, right arm? I believe. Okay. Yeah. And um, there's a couple of different opinions okay. about, you know, the idea of an Imam Dhamin. You know, whether it was the coins that were minted with the names okay. of the Imams, it was easy then to get access to a coin like that and put it on. Yes. Then there's another narration about an Imam offering protection. You know, Imams are the protectors of God's creation. You know, they're designated by Allah to lead mankind and... That creation also includes the, the animal kingdom, you know, and supposedly there was a deer about to be slaughtered. Right. And before that deer is uh, slaughtered, the imam asks the owner that let that deer go and she will return. The deer goes and comes back and, you know, the owner is astonished that the deer even came back because once you let an animal go, it, and it's as if that deer wanted to go and see its family and then return and it was, uh, you know, there was a protection from the imam and an honor and trust from the Imam at that moment. And so people believe that if you're going on a journey, maybe some sadaqah is paid, or some coin is placed, or some Quranic verses, there's difference of opinion. Okay, yeah. okay. And did the Holy Imam, I'm sure he had other um, devout companions, as it were. Were there other devout companions, as it were, that were like... Well, yeah, for sure. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Yunus bin Abdul Rahman, mm -hmm. Ali bin Maziar, as an example, Ayyub bin Nuh, um, Rayyan ibn Salt, ibn Shabib, Da'bal bin Ali al-Khuzai. I'd say there's over 300 people who have narrated in our works from Imam al Radha alayhi salam. Okay, yeah. okay. So, phenomenal number of companions and each with their own skills. Okay, yeah. we won't quite go to the Holy Imam Shahadat, but yeah. If we just go back now, and he had the debates, as it were, numerous debates, uh, discussions, you know, spread his elm, as it were, the knowledge. So how, how was the continuing relationship with him, the holy imam, and Ma'amun? How did it progress further now? I think um, it becomes more tense as, as things go along. Right. You see, I'm not, I'm not going to say that there wasn't certain stands or positions that al Ma'mun took that weren't praiseworthy. I remember one of the people who sought to protect the belief in Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib being the first of those who submitted to the religion of Islam. Mm -hmm. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa bought the religion, al Ma'mun has a famous discussion where there were people who said, you can't count Ali ibn Abi Talib as a young Muslim. He's too young uh, to count him as the first Muslim. You've got to count him as this young boy, and we don't know if he understood Islam. Right. And Al-Ma'mun famously tells the person, did the Holy Prophet ask him to accept Islam? So the person's like, yeah. He goes, the Holy Prophet speaks from his own will or from the Lord? Is that from the Lord? So he goes, so Allah didn't know that Ali ibn Abi Talib was too young to understand the religion <laughs> of Islam? So I'm not going to say that there weren't certain stands, even on the issue of Fedak, right. the back and forth. But I think what begins to happen is he begins to see the popularity of the Imam. There's great popularity for his, for his demeanor, for his ethics, for his wisdom, for his knowledge. And that gets to him. Okay. And I think at the same time, the Imam begins to become more outspoken against him. Right. right. Um, if you look, for example... Uh, two people come and visit the Im uh, come to the Imam and they ask him a question about the Qasr prayer. 
the short-term prayer. And when they ask him this question about the Qasr prayer, they say to him, we've come on this long journey and we want to ask you a question. Do we pray Qasr or no? And the Imam at this moment looks at the two of them. He says, who have you come to see? He's like, I've come to see Al-Ma'mun. And he goes to the other one, who have you come to visit? He's like, I've come to visit you. So he tells the first one, you pray full, you pray Qasr. Because for you, you don't need to, count, you don't need to think about Qasr and full anymore. When you're coming to visit people like that, you don't need to worry about Qasr and full. Okay. For the one who's come to visit me, I give you the ruling of Qasr. So you've got this certainly uh, creates a tension where the Imam now becomes uh, more and more open about his opinions at the time. Okay, so we've now got a few questions. Um, so I'll pose to you two or three. Yep. Um, and hopefully there can be quick answers, as it were, inshallah. So Hardy um, from, uh, it doesn't quite give me the, um, the country's name. My question is, why is Imam Ali al-Rida al-Islam referred to as Gharib al ghuraba in Ziyarat? So that's the first one. Um, second one is, how many salam Sayyidina, um, how many sisters did Imam Radha alayhi salam have? Um, were they married? Um, if not, why were they not married? From Mujtaba Sayyid from South End on Sea. And the third question, if we can maybe talk very quickly, is maybe about uh, are there any books translated in English about Imam Radha alayhi salam that you would highly recommend? Okay, in terms of the first one, why is he known as Gharib al Ghuraba? Yeah. Naturally, because he's an Imam who's buried in an area where he's a stranger at that time. The, the other Imams, four of them are in Medina. Mm -hmm. You know, Imam al Hussein is in Karbala, but he has companions and sure. family around him. Imam Amir al Mumin has two prophets next to him. Spine. You know, so, but Imam al Radha alayhi salam, Imam al Kadhim has Imam al Jawad, Imam al Hadi has Imam al Askari. Mm -hmm. But Imam al Radha alayhi salam alone. And for many years, you know, that was difficult for the Ahlul Bayt. But, um, you know, in our ziyarah, we say, Assalamu alayka ya gharib al ghuraba wa anis al fuqara. That is in its origin because he was alone in Khurasan. I suppose today the gharib would be Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Now, in terms of um, the second one, did Imam al Radha alayhi salam have any sisters? Have any sisters? Yes. Yeah, Imam al Radha had about 19 sisters. Um, and then the follow-up to that is, why didn't they get married? Yes, is that, that's that? right. If they were not married. Oh, they didn't get married because of the oppression against the Shia at the time. Right. Um, the Shia at the time, you couldn't even openly say that you were Shia. Um, number one. You know, there were certain personalities who had to act insane. There were certain personalities who had to sell butter to earn a living and never admit their Shia. There's some who were Shia who had to work for Harun Rashid and never reveal what they were. Taqiyya was rife. Yes. It's extremely difficult at that time, therefore, to even begin a family in some cases. Um, so you had that. And secondly, a lot of these daughters had to leave home. Okay. Okay. We have a shrine for the daughters of Imam al Kadhim in Azerbaijan. Why would the daughter of Imam al Kadhim and the sister of Imam al Radha have to go to Azerbaijan? pretty much shows you just how bad conditions were at the time. And Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi, uh, may Allah bless his soul, he mentions it um, in his discussion when people ask him about the marriages of the daughters of Imam um, Musa al kadhim and he makes it clear that um, it's because of the difficulties and the oppression at the time, that's why they did not get yeah. married. You know, it's not as easy as, for example, Imam al Baqir's time um, or Imam al sadiqs time where it was a bit easier to be okay. married. Imam al kadhims time, when an Imam is put in prison for virtually 20 years of his life, yeah, yeah. I don't think you can say that about any other Imam of Ahl al-Bayt. Third question was the books, books in English. Any recommend in English? In English highly on, recommend as it were. In English on Imam al-Radha alayhi salam, I personally would say, Ayyun Akhbar al-Radha of Sheikh al-Saduq, it's available in English. And I'd also look at uh, Sharif Baqir al-Qarashi or Qarashi's work on the biography of Imam al-Radha alayhi salam, which Ansariyan, Ansariyan yeah, published. Um, has published both. 
Yeah. yeah. Um, and in terms of, I think what also was uh, key for this uh, program was the importance of the holy imam's ziyarah, as it were, visitation. Yes, I, you know, when you see that the ziyarah of Imam al Radha is compared to the ziyarah of Imam al Hussein, salam, both were gharib at certain moments in their life. Both died as martyrs. For both, there were difficult conditions of coercion in their lives. But you find the tradition saying whoever visits Imam al Radha, alayhi salam, mm -hmm. Whatever difficulties they have in their life are removed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, okay. So now we have a caller on the line. Salaamu alaykum. Salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Alaykum salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the singers for returning live in London for season three. I think it's an amazing show, very informative. Thank you. Um, my, my name is Abbas. I'm calling from Switzerland. Uh, my question is to the Sayyid is uh, Imam al Rida alayhi salam. He took, a, he took a position under, I believe it's Al Ma'moon in government. And you know, that's quite, it's quite confusing because our Imams don't work with tyrannical leaders. So I just wanted to know what was the reason why Imam Al Rabba took up that position? Well, I think I answered it for about 76 minutes of the show. Uh, but I'll repeat again you know, this wasn't something which the Imam wanted, rather, it was something that was forced upon uh, the Imam. Uh, and you find that al Ma'mun refers to the Shura which Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, was involved in in highlighting a similarity in the compulsion that was involved. However, if you're working for a government that's not necessarily a Muslim government, there are instances, whether it's Nabi Yusuf or whether it's Ali ibn Yaqeen or Imam al where this at times may be permissible if a, a person doesn't compromise their values, which the Imam didn't. No. And B, you can safeguard the future of the followers of Ahlul Bayt. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Abbas from Switzerland. Okay. We have uh, another question. Is it true that the bodies of our Imams, the holy Imams of Islam, are taken away from their graves just after three days? Yeah, there is an opinion, certainly within our hadiths, that three days after um, the death, uh, or the martyrdom of the Imam that um, these bodies are taken from where they're buried. Okay, there's yeah. one more question related to Imam Hussein al Islam. Um, why is Imam Hussein al Islam buried 13 steps away from Qadalgar where he was slain? Why not at the spot where he was martyred? Well, it's interesting, 13 steps. I'm very interested that it's calculated 13 steps, but where he was beheaded, after he was beheaded, the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, was then kicked around by the hooves of the horses of the army of Omar bin Sa'd. Right. So you would think that, you know, injury was enough from their end, but they added insult. And you know, for, for the Arabs, this was nothing that had been seen. This was a return to the days of Jahiliya, where Omar bin Sa'd asked his horse riders, ride your horses and trample on the chest of Hussein. And so they began to kick his body around until his body was eventually buried. But where it was kicked was different to where he was beheaded. Okay, so that's yeah. great. Um, from narrations, I think we gather that uh, the Holy Masoom, Imam Ali, Alullah alayhi salam, was a very wealthy Imam as well. Yeah. In fact, he was the owner, and he is the owner, according to narrations, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. of the whole of Khurasan to this day. Is that true? Well, you find that I think if you go to that area and you go to that country, you know, um, you'll find that Iran virtually lives off the Sadaqa Jari of Imam al Radha alayhi salam. You yes. know, if you look at the Astana Quds al Razawi, you'll see over there the unbelievable barakah mm -hmm. from Imam al Radha alayhi salam, from the shrine. And now you find around the shrine there is all these buildings that are bought, right. there's even libraries, supermarkets, you know, different other seminaries for people to study in. And this was all from the barakah of that, you know, first move, you know. So definitely each of the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt, where they are buried, uh, no doubt, you know, it really is that earth is honored mm -hmm. and is at peace. 
um, with where the imam is buried. Okay, I think we've just got a few minutes left. So what I want to do is hopefully, inshallah, if we can maybe perhaps talk about some of his famous du'as, as it were. There's a, a collection of Sahifa al Radawiya, as it were. Well, Sahifa al Radawiya is not so much. Um, because you imagine Sahifa, so you, you think Sahifa said Jadiyya. Right. Sahifa Radawiya. And um, Sahifa Radawiya actually. It's a collection of about 200 odd hadiths. Okay. Yeah. Not yeah. the was. Uh, no, no. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, you'll find that there are supplications right. from every Imam of Ahlul Bayt. You know, there is no, no school like you know, the Shia when it comes to supplications, no school comes near. Um, no one can come near Dua Kumail, or Dua Yastashir, or mm. Dua Abu Hamza Thamali, or Dua Mashlul, or Dua Arafa. So, you know, that puts us in a different league. But Sahifa al Radawiya, Sahifa al Rida, Sahifa al Rida, Abdullah, the son of Ahmed, son of Amr, from Ahmed bin Amr, from Imam al Rida alayhi salam. Um, it's a collection of traditions from Imam Rada from something, from something as broad as jihad to food and ointments. Right. You know, and I think there's one aspect of Imam Rada where he, he seeks to look at the growth of the physical and the spiritual. Yes, you know, starting with the Prophet, medicine of the Prophet. Yes. Going on to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt and their stress on what we eat, how we eat, when we eat. Okay. And with Imam al Radha there's a focus, as we had mentioned in the Golden Medical Dissertation, the first, um, in the first part of this uh, two-part series, that we had mentioned how he talks about the heart and the, you know, and he talks about the different limbs and That's organs, right. and he talks yes. about which foods are good for them. Mm -hmm. And I think in Sahib al Radha, you'll find that um, he discusses food and ointments. Okay. Um, I think Sahib al Radha was published. There's a publish. There's a published version of Sahih al from Cairo from like a hundred years back or something, um, which I think is available translated in English now. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, and even talk about jihad and multiple other areas as well. Okay, yeah. okay. So we just got time for a couple of questions. Yep. Um, let me just uh, flick back to the questions. Um, these are slightly off topic, um, but... Uh, Alaikum salam. Someone calling? Okay, so the question, the question from a um, Michigan, Dearborn, Michigan, is um, it's on fact, slightly off topic. Um, if the husband doesn't permit permit the wife to keep the children, and she me remarries in the future, is it a sin on the mother if she goes against his will and keeps the children? If the husband doesn't permit the wife. If the husband doesn't permit the wife to keep the children, if she remarries, remarries in the future, is it a sin on the mother if she goes against his will and keeps the children? Yeah, from what I'm understanding of this question, we'll find that custody, normally within the Islamic tradition, mm -hmm. there are ages of custody when it comes to the boy and the girl. You'll for, normally find the ages of two and seven mentioned. And so if there is a divorce that takes place, up to those ages, you can keep the, the, mother, the divorced wife can keep either the son or the daughter. And then after those ages, they are meant to go towards the husband. However, the scholars say, the husband should recognize the importance of the mother. Right. And not be so strict by, okay, the age of two, the age of seven, now you bring me the boy, bring me the girl, I'm going to take okay. them away from you. Um, but then there is the opinion that once that mother, she's got the kids, once she remarries, then the kids are meant to be going back towards the father. father. However, in such cases, I think there needs to be communication. Yeah, sure. And there needs to be appreciation of the motherly role in upbringing. Okay, yeah. okay. I think that's all we have time for from um, Thank Sina. you. Thank See you, you next week. Sid, Dr. Mark Shwani. From Imam Hussein TV, I'd like to wish everyone Eid Mubarak once again for last week's Wilad of Imam Lula al Islam. Hope you've enjoyed this two part uh, program. From all of us here, Salaam Alaikum. <laughs>